most of us have either read the Charles Dickens classic, A Christmas Carol, or we've seen the many versions of it on film. Although it's 175 years old, it remains one of the season's most beloved stories because it taps into themes and experiences to which we can all relate. The story leads the reader on the journey of the mean and tight-fisted old man, Ebenezer Scrooge, through Christmases from his past, present, and future. I found a good joke about him. Why does Scrooge love Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer? Because every buck is dear to him. <laughs> well, Scrooge has the experience of a lifetime that cold Christmas night eve, starting with a visit from the ghost of his equally stingy former partner, Jacob Marley, who warns Ebenezer to change his ways or wear the heavy chains of regret that he himself wears for eternity. Scrooge goes to bed after this terrifying visitation, and he nervously passes the whole experience off as just a bit of undigested beef. But as we know, the journey he takes that night with the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future ends up to be a journey of transformation, healing, and ultimately hope. Like Mr. Scrooge, Christmas is a time of vivid memories for all of us. Some wonderful and rich, maybe some not so great, perhaps even painful and challenging. Dickens was vividly aware of this universal experience of Christmas when he wrote A Christmas Carol, aware of how loaded the subject of Christmas can be for each of us. And Scrooge was the poster child for having issues with Christmas. Well, after Marley's visit, Scrooge goes to bed, and he is soon awakened by the ghost of Christmas past, who leads him on the pilgrimage of happy and sad scenes from Christmases of his youth and his young adulthood, scenes that help the reader understand how he became the man that he was. At the end of her time with Scrooge, the ghost of Christmas past says, I told you, these were shadows of the things that have been. That they are what they are, do not blame me. Yes, the past is merely a shadow of things that have been. The past no longer exists. And yet, both our happy and sometimes troubling memories linger and yet serve to teach us. Well, we all know how this timeless Christmas story unfolds, and we've done our own relating to it in years past. We've wrestled our own ghosts, and we've chased our own spirits. Today, I want to share my own personal journey with the spirits of Christmas past, present, and future, some of which you may relate to in terms of, the own, of your own Christmases in your life. As we begin this journey, let's rename the ghost of Christmas past, the spirit of Christmas past. And let's start from the beginning of all Christmases, childhood, from the birth of the infant Jesus 2,000 years ago to the birth of the little person that you once were. In a recent conversation with my dad, I talked with him about his work with his psychotherapy clients on the relevance of the inner child. To quote him, I believe in the inner child because at one time that's all you were. I believe in the inner child because at one time, that's all you were. Think about that for a moment. At one time, that's all you were. You were that pure being, the essence of innocence, open and responsive 
to all expressions of love and kindness. The true Christmas spirit was your kingdom. The spirit of Christmas past reminds us of this, not only in the magnificent story of the birth of the Christ child over 2,000 years ago, adored and worshipped by the most lowly shepherds and the most exotic kings, but in the child that you were, the self-same child that you carry around inside as your inner child, the little golden boy or girl that trusted in the magic of life, its possibilities, its richest qualities, its wonder, and your own and everyone else's goodness. As a young mother back in the 1970s, I had the opportunity to watch this beautiful interplay between my small children and the magic of Christmas and witness it more vividly than I can recall from even my own childhood. If you want to experience a second childhood, have children, is what they say. I remember watching the big-eyed wonder in the face of my two-month-old son when I placed him in his infant seat right next to the Christmas tree, covered with shiny baubles and brilliant lights, seeing his little legs kick and his tiny baby expressions of excitement. I remember seeing my toddler overcome by Christmas morning, by the sight of a tricycle, play school desk, a barrel full of colorful blocks, his sweet little face dumbfounded, disbelieving and momentarily confused by being the recipient of such marvels. Those of you who are parents have your own indelible images of your small children's delight at Christmas time. But Christmas has many faces. Like the Christmas, all the presents my grandmother had hand-delivered in a big black trash bag several weeks earlier got accidentally put out on the curb by my little brother on trash day. That was a heartbreak. Or the Christmases when somebody, somebody in the family was sick or perhaps going through their transition. The Christmases spent trying to catch a plane in bad weather or the lonely Christmases after a death, a breakup, or a divorce. A few years after the previous scene with my children in front of the Christmas tree, I was a single mom, barely making ends meet and trying to create a semblance of Christmas for my boys. That Christmas Eve, I was overcome with a sense of sadness and resignation while wrapping up what just seemed like a mountain of brightly colored plastic. Legos, race cars, games, all the things very little boys at that time liked. I thought, can't I give my children any more than just a bunch of plastic? What had happened to the magic the tangible, relatable qualities of Christmas that I had grown up with. Could I alone replicate them for my young family? I tried the best I could. Several years later, one gray winter day close to Christmas, I was feeling at the end of my rope, emotionally, financially, and spiritually, as that young single mother negotiating joint custody of my two young sons, I was working two jobs and struggling with bills and endless responsibilities. That morning when the boys were at their father's house, I found myself in an overwhelming and uncontrollable bout of weeping. It seemed like the tears would never stop. They came from what felt like a bottomless pit of loss, sorrow, and confusion. I did what many of us do at some point in their life. I fell to my knees, and I said, God, help me, please, help me. 
Soon after this, I began to calm somewhat, and I sat down on the couch. Although it was morning, and I was not tired, I felt a strange sleepiness come over me. I found myself slipping into this odd, sleepy state, and I must have fallen asleep when only a short time later I was awakened by the sound of footsteps coming down the wooden staircase from the second story of my house, which entered directly into the living room where I was lying on the couch. I thought I was alone in the house, and the sound alarmed me, but I was simultaneously under the influence of this strange, thick cloak of sleepiness that I could not, for the life of me, snap out of. Well, a young man walked into the room and he sat down next to me on the couch. I tried to wake fully up, but I kept being overwhelmed by this strange drug-like effect and I would struggle to sit up and then I would flop back down on the couch, unable to shake myself out of it. I was able to sit up and be somewhat conscious long enough to feel an overwhelming presence of love emanating from this silent person, this being, the powerful extent of which I had never felt the likes of before. The sense of it was tangible. It was total, unconditional, and complete. I was immersed in the bliss of it. And having never felt anything like this feeling before, and being a young woman and not fully understanding who he was or why he was there, I asked him, are you my soulmate? Are you my love? And he simply, though lovingly stated, that's not who I am. Those are the only words that he spoke. I remain seated next to this incredible being, immersed in a field of total love, but still unable to awaken completely, when soon the sleep overpowered me and I fell back on the, on the, pouch, on the couch. When I awoke soon after, I was completely clear-headed, and I remembered everything that had happened, and I knew I knew that this was not a dream. The young man was gone. There was no sign of him. I checked the doors, and they remained dead bolted and chained from the inside. Even though there was no access to my home from the second floor, I looked around upstairs, and I found nothing out of place. Well, I want you to know that although I consider myself a pretty intuitive person and even occasionally feel when people are thinking of me or the presence of nature spirits or the spirits of people who have moved on, there was not, this was not a usual occurrence for me like it might be for some people that I know or even some of you. Having no other explanation for this experience, I came to the conclusion, and I now know in my heart, that this being was a spirit, perhaps an angel, or perhaps the Christ presence, sent to reassure me at a critical time in my life that I am completely loved, that my prayers are heard, and I am totally cared for. I believe that I was put into a semi-conscious state because I was not ready to experience the raw, awesome power of his presence or the experience of pure, undiluted love. It would have been too much for me to consider or process if fully awake. I have never, before or since, felt love like that. Pure love is the most powerful presence in the universe. It would melt even the most hardened heart, which would surrender and bow readily to its presence. It was a feeling that was unmis unmistakably that of love and nothing but love. 
my beautiful visitor also came to teach me that worlds and dimensions do overlap. God opens the door of the spirit world to infiltrate our dense, rigid material world. And when that occurs, miracles happen, lives are changed, we learn that we are loved unconditionally and with deep compassion for our earthly cares and concerns, and that we are never, ever alone. This experience of God's grace will forever impact my life. Even if I never have another visitation like this one, I know that it is possible, and I know that it happened. And I feel blessed beyond measure by having met him and experiencing um, divine love's tangible presence in my life. The spirit of Christmas past. Overall, my earliest memories of Christmas were of a magical time. In my family, we didn't have a lot of money, but there was music and parties and celebration. We decked the halls and we waited for Santa. We made space for all that is sacred and reverent as well. My ghosts of Christmas past, the ones like many of Scrooge's that still invoke their memories of regrets, disappointments, and loneliness are there. But the spirits of Christmas past, the ones that come to serve us with love when we least expect it and we need it the most, the ones who open the door to a different reality and usher us into the realm of beauty and miracles, these and other uh, memories have served to override those darker times. And the spirits of Christmas's past remain beacons of light shining into the present moment. As Unity Minister Reverend Barbara Hadley wrote in her piece, Faith in Christmas, God's love expresses in these tiny moments of life. And when I remember, I can string these pearls of love together and know with deep abiding faith that God is always present even when I am wandering. Ah, the bell tolls for yet another spirit. The spirit of Christmas present. Yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, today is a gift. That's why they call it the present. Yesterday is a history, tomorrow is a mystery, today is a gift, that's why they call it the present. Let's look at some of the levels of Christmas present that you may be experiencing right now. I know that I am. Well, with all that's happening in the world these days, on the surface this Christmas, there may be a level of doubt, fear, maybe resignation. There may be a level of duty, duty to shop for friends and loved ones, spend more money than we can afford, travel, accommodate. There may be a level of lassitude over the never-endingness of Christmas, the certitude of its annual observance. Oh boy, here comes another Christmas. There may be a level of annoyance over the media's constant barrage of advertising, pushing us to be consumers of yet another product that we may or may not need or want. There may be a level of exhaustion. How many Christmases have I lived through? 50, 60, 90? What else does Christmas want of us? Well, let's go a little deeper still, one more level into the spirit of Christmas present. On this level, Christmas gets more real and more personal. The glaring flashing lights in big box store aisles give way to the cheerful string bulbs laced over homes, businesses, and Christmas trees. Wonderlands of beauty that take your breath away are created, like the one Bruce and I visited down in the Van Dusen Gardens Festival of Lights last week. 
Greeting cards come from near and far, and smiles, hugs, and time well spent are gifts given and received. Goodwill is shown through donors and volunteers that benefit children, the homeless, and the hungry, our servicemen and women, and families in far countries who need a hand, who need a hand up. Treasured family traditions are followed, good food is sh shared, good times are had, goodwill is extended. And when you go down one more level into Christmas present, where our closest friends and loved ones share intimate and tender moments by a crackling fire, you watch the embers burn and the fire die, and you go even deeper still, and you find in the present the solitude of your own being, where a single candle glows, the Christ light of truth that resides and burns in our hearts and billions of other hearts and forever illumines the world. Here's the place in the present that we know in the deepest core of our being that the Christ reborn in us in every moment is the way, is the truth and the life and the light that illumines our path and is ours to share generously with the world. Okay, are you ready to trek into the not-so-distant future? The spirit of Christmas future. It's only a week away, and Bruce and I are looking forward to celebrating with you this Wednesday at our wonderful candlelighting service, and also next Christmas Eve, where we'll be making sacred space together. Let's take another look at the spirit of Christmas future. In Scrooge's story, the ghost of Christmas future came to him as a foreboding hood-shaped skeleton who introduced him to the eventuality of his own death as a man reviled, pillaged, and scorned. Well, Fear and remorse can be excellent teachers in life. And like Scrooge, I have learned from this pair on more than one occasion myself. But I have a choice. And nowadays, I choose to see myself in the spirit of Christmas future, in the brighter light of truth. Someone once told me that their definition of happiness was something to do someone to love, and something to look forward to. Something to do, someone to love, and something to look forward to. I like that. Letting go of the regrets and the disappointments of the past and letting go of the fear of the future is the state of consciousness that we seek in order to access this kind of optimism with something to look forward to in life. In order to do that, we call upon the spirit of Christmas future, or I'd like to think another name for it is the Holy Spirit, the spirit that transcends all time. I'd like to share a quote from A Course in Miracles about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit abides in the part of your mind that is the Christ mind. He seems to be a voice, for in that form he speaks God's word to you. He seems to be a guide through a far country, for you need that form of help. He seems to be whatever meets the needs you think you have. But he is not deceived when you perceive yourself in traps, entrapped in needs you do not have. It is from these he would deliver you. It is from these he would make you safe. Accept your Father's gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. This Christmas season, perhaps the most important thing to remember is that the Holy Spirit is the greatest gift that is yours to receive. And it is God's gift to the world, past, present, and future. It's the voice for brotherly and sisterly love, for forgiveness, and for letting go. 
The Holy Spirit sends us a messenger of hope when all feels hopeless. It is the presence of peace amidst strife and conflict. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of lavish generosity and abundant sharing of all of God's gifts and the welling up of joy in our hearts for no reason at all. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of the inner child in your heart, innocent, playful, and full of excitement about life. As Scrooge giddily said after he had finished his, night long, his long night among the ghosts and found himself quite alive and given another chance to share the true meaning of Christmas, I don't know what day of the month it is. I don't know how long I've been among the spirits. I don't know anything. I'm quite a baby. Never mind, I don't care. I'd rather be a baby. It's that kind of rebirth at Christmas that we long for. A clean slate, a pure heart, a fresh start. And so we've had some time together today to look at Christmas past, present, and future. I'd like to hope that what I shared with you today will serve as a, like a hologram or a sphere, a, a Christmas ball that you can take home and hang on your tree. Charles Dickens closed out his story with these words about our old friend, the now transformed Scrooge, and I don't think Charles would mind if I borrowed them now, too. It was always said of Scrooge that he knew how to keep Christmas well. If any man alive possessed the knowledge, may that be truly said of us and all of us. In an ending, I will borrow again from Dickens and quote the voice of childlike innocence and eternal optimism, the sweet and gentle Tiny Tim, and say, God bless us, everyone. Thank you.